Hello everybody, X-Ray OP here, coming at you all with another video. And today we have a review of chapter 1022, The Stars Take the Stage. So the way that this chapter starts out, it pretty much reminds us how everything's going. It reminds us that originally it started out 5,400 against 30,000 men. And now with Tama's a little double fruit ability as well as a lot of Kaido's men being taken down, the tides have shifted. It doesn't give us an exact number of how many people are now on our side, but I believe they did that in the past chapter. It also reminds us about how the Todoroki are doing, meaning Drake left and the rest have gotten beaten down. Which is a bummer. I wanted to see more of Jean Bay versus Who's Who. Uh, Black Maria and Robin, yeah, I, I definitely would have liked to see a little bit more of that. Uh, Frankie versus, uh, what's Kurzy? I don't remember his name, nor do I care enough to look it up, because, I don't know. It seemed like an interesting fight, but overall, it's not one I need to see again. And now, we're actually given a little timeline, because the main island, it, where the battle's taking place, is about to approach the flower capital. And while I don't exactly know, remember what they're going to do once they reach it. My money's on, a lot of people are probably going to get hurt. And it's going to reach there in about 15 minutes. So, yeah. But overall, um, with the way these timelines in One Piece work, it real, it's supposed to fill me with a sense of dread and urgency, but... I don't know. I remember I recently rewatched the Alabasta arc, and they had five minutes to bring down Crocodile's last resort. And, well, it went on forever. Yeah, so One Piece, um, as well as some other anime, just generally don't have a good sense of time, which for me really, it really diminishes the urgency and the fear. So it's supposed to worry me, but it just doesn't really hit very hard. But anyway, up next we have, uh, what's his name? Rizo versus the guy named Fukuroju. He's the guy with the big head and the very long earlobes. Like, Enaru earlobes. Yes, Enaru, I watched the dub. Get over it. Uh, but anyway, overall, uh, I don't know. I don't really care about this fight too much. Because, well, I'm not really a fan of Rizo and this uh, big head and ear guy. It just doesn't interest me whatsoever. However, it does bring up an interesting topic about how Rizo left the little ninja clan. While the rest of them, aside from that one lady who's always talking about being a mature woman, stayed with Orochi. And how it's their emote. And he's talking about how Raizo's sense of duty to Odin has really clouded his judgment. But then Raizo states how they're all fighting for the emotional bond that they share. And then it cuts to all of uh, Owen's vassals and all the states that they're in with, you know, Kinemon probably being dead. I do not believe that for a second. And uh, what's his name? Uh, Asura, I believe his name is, also looking dead. Again, don't believe it. And it's just and these panels aside from this one where i cannot see for the life of me who it is probably kiku i see blood but uh, i don't know it's a great panel and it really does show that these guys have an emotional bond to odin and are and with the people that look dead even though i still obviously don't believe they're dead it's one piece for god's sake we are definitely willing to die in order to pursue odin's dream it's just a beautiful panel. So yeah, I really enjoyed that. But another thing that I found a little, while less uh, heartwarming, I definitely find a little bit more interesting, 
and that is Killer versus Vass Vassal Hawkins. Now, overall, Hawkins is not my favorite member of the Worst Generation. I like his design probably more than any other, but that's about it. Except maybe uh, Drake might have a more interesting design to me. But overall, Hawkins has a really cool design. But as a character, I find him somewhat interesting, but that's about it. And basically, although one thing I find interesting about him is his double fruit. And how all the dolls that he puts inside of him resemble somebody else's life. So if Killer does the deadly blow, somebody else gets hurt until he runs out of them. And this is where things get interesting. This adds more of a sense of urgency and dread than the whole island about to hit the flower capital thing. And that's the fact that Hawkins is down to one doll left. One little voodoo doll. And it belongs to Kid. That hits me a little even harder than the whole floating island thing. Because it's like, Killer clearly has more loyalty to Kid than anybody else in the world. He's his captain, he's his friend. Like, you know, he, Killer's one of the few people who can actually tell off Kid and live to tell the tale. So. The rest of the people are those who are stronger than Kid. Which Kid isn't a ridiculously strong guy. I'd say most of the stronger Straw Hats. I'd say Jinbei and above. Jinbei or Sanji and above would definitely be able to take him. But he is pretty tough. But they have that bond and now it's being threatened because he can't kill Hawkins without killing Kid, you know. Now, granted, I do have a couple theories of how he could do it. One, he could just beat the ever-living crap out of Kid. You know, sure, not Kid Hawkins. Sure, Kid's going to feel it, but by the end of the day, Hawkins is going to probably take most of the damage. Well, probably not. Actually, no, wait. His double fruit doesn't allow him to take any damage until they're done. So, yeah, it's just going to be Kid. I don't know. The other thing is, I don't know if Kid's a user of hockey. I think... I could look into that, but I don't know if he has armament hockey yet. I'm pretty sure Kid does. Killer, I'm not so sure. On a quick fun fact, Kid is actually a user of Conqueror's hockey, which I believe they recently spoiled in the anime, just like they did for Zor. But anyway, Kid could probably use hockey, and that might negate uh, Hawkins' power and actually hurt him instead of Kid. Or he could use Sea Prism Stone to just straight up cancel out his powers, but I don't see how he's supposed to use that. But anyway, I do hope that we have some sort of resolution without, you know, killer, killing, kid. Uh, kind of a tongue twister. But anyway. I yeah, said so that five times fast. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. That definitely interests me, because it does instill that sense of, like, oh, man, how's he going to do this? This is actually getting kind of worrisome. I don't know. One Piece does tend to have some cop-outs, so there will probably be some plot armor involved. We all know it's true. Don't complain. And then we get into the bread and butter of this chapter, and that is the situation with king and queen going up against pretty much everybody and it is like an amazing beautiful yet terrifying fine panel where you just see the giants that are king and queen and while queen does look really ridiculous in his hybrid form and i'm excited to see king in his hybrid form there's this ball of fire there's just this wall of fire that surrounds them and you can see that it is they are causing some pain to those gifters that Tama changed. And they are saying, you guys are going to pay for betraying us. And like, you know, they don't know that it's not their fault. Well, I think Queen might. Maybe they do. But by the yeah. Sorry, it's still morning. But by the end of the day, they probably don't really understand Tama's power. So they probably don't realize they're completely acting out of their own free will. And even if they did, they probably don't care. 
And one thing this chapter has been really good at is make me actually worry for them. Like I said, One Piece tends to have plot conveniences, not like fairy tale level of, pol of plot conveniences, but they tend to happen. So it's always been kind of a challenge for the series to install me with a sense of dread. But this chapter really kind of did that. And it's not just the panels with Sanji being down or Zoro still taking time to heal. No, the thing that really, really worries me is the panel where Marco is down. He's just exhausted. He's beat. Which was a huge surprise to me. Because to be honest, this guy is ridiculously strong. I think he's one of the most underrated powerhouses in all of One Piece. Um, like we remember earlier, King and Queen were saying, is this guy invincible or something? Because Delford, as far as like defense goes, is ridiculously overpowered. And we did learn in this raid, pretty overpowered as far as offense too. But this guy, during Marineford, which was two years ago, and he has had time to get stronger. Granted, he spent that time being a doctor in a small village, so he probably didn't, but he did have time to. And that's back when this guy was such a good hockey user. He could actually go up against the admirals. He kicked Kizaru all the way into the wall, which granted didn't hurt him, but still. And then he, bl then he blindsided Aokiji. Or, you know, Kuzan, he's not an admiral anymore. And yeah, the fact that this guy's down and out, I kind of thought he was the strongest person they had on their side, except maybe Luffy. And that's a big maybe. I honestly could definitely see Marco taking Luffy. Oh, and uh, speaking of Luffy, I forgot to mention, there was like a panel that you were supposed to take seriously, but with Luffy there, it's kind of hard to, because he was all fat and stuff, because he'd eaten all the meat. So he's almost back in the fight. Anyway, back to Marco. It is just crazy to see this guy who's so powerful, like, pretty much defeated. And then the rest of the chapters pretty much hold off King and Queen until Zoro gets better. And so Sanji, even though he's pretty much on the ground, he is exhausted, goes to fight them anyway. And then you see one, a guy who's probably one of my least favorite characters, Pero Sparrow, aiming a bow and arrow at Sanji. Made of candy, I'm guessing. Right at him. <sighs> it kind of brings us back to Old Cake Island for a second. There's no flashback or anything. But he goes, if you would have just married Pudding, like we said, I wouldn't have to do this. Although, granted, if he'd married Pudding, he'd be dead because it was just an assassination attempt. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I guess he wouldn't have to do this anyway. They would just have Jerma's weapons, and they wouldn't have had to ally with the beasts. And about to hit Sanji, and here comes one of those plot conveniences. But it's so awesome, I don't care. Here comes Cat Viper. People I know, you probably prefer his Japanese name. I don't care. That is... I'm not going to even try to pronounce it. He comes out. And just blind, and again, blindsides Pero Sparrow. And we all, and if any of you guys remember, Pero Sparrow originally went up against uh, Carrot and the one dog lady, I can't remember her name. <sighs> Sorry, still kind of tired. I just got up like 20, like maybe half an hour ago before making this. And, you know, Pear Sparrow went out of that fight pretty much unharmed. Now, that would have been different if she was in the, if Carrot was in the Sulong form. But overall, yeah. He did not, he did pretty well in that fight. However, he's up against Cat Viper now. And he is on a whole other level than Carrot. Like, I could not see Carrot taking Cat Viper outside of her Sulong form. And even then, I, I don't know, this guy's pretty tough. You know, given the fact that he was on Whitebeard's crew and Roger's crew. And then he just hits him, and he just tears into, I don't even know where, just like, it was right into the ground, and it is a sight to see, because I really don't like Pear Sparrow. And he is here to, uh, 
but Cat Viper is here to avenge Pedro. Well, yeah, I wasn't a huge fan of Pedro. I always liked the guy, but I didn't really care about him that much. But yeah, the fact that Cat Viper did obviously cared so much about that guy, and now he's down, especially since there was the first failed attempt at revenge for him. This is definitely, like, this is a fulfilling feeling. Especially since I know, well, you know, Perro Sparrows, he's tough. He is a strong dude. Cat Viper's gonna dominate him. I, I just know it. And then, after that's done, you go right back to keep Zoro safe until he's recovered. And one thing I find funny is, during this... During this chapter, oh, we get to see Chopper again in his old man form, how he's so tiny and stuff, and he's actually calling like Zoro lad and stuff. Granted, I'm watching a scan, I'm reading a scan copy, this isn't like the Viz translation or anything. But, so, uh, it may be incorrect what he's saying, but basically he's calling Zoro lad and stuff. He's calling someone a young whippersnapper, talking like an old man. It kind of, kind of... Makes me miss Kaku, the fact that he's, like, talking as an old man. Just, uh, it just reminds me of Kaku, because that guy would always talk like an old man. And I like Kaku. He was probably my favorite CP9 member. Either him or Jabra. But King finds Zoro. Still looking like a cross made of, uh, what's that stuff called, gauze or something? Whatever they put around people to heal them. And he conjures a thing of fire. And then a certain phoenix man steps in the way. And it is an awesome panel. At first, I, because I couldn't really see the details very well, because, like, you know, manga's just in black and white, it's kind of hard to disparage what it is. I kind of thought it was Sanji showing us a new move, since it definitely looked like fire. Uh, but no, it's Marco, and I guess he's like swinging his wings around in like some big propeller-like thing. And it is a sight to see. Like, it is really cool. And this is probably one of my favorite panels in the entire chapter. And that's saying something, because there were some pretty good, ch good panels. But this one was definitely one of my favorites. Not my overall favorite, but one of them. And he goes, I used to hear rumors about a certain fire-conjuring race that lived on top of the red line. King of the flames, huh? And that is so cool. Because to this day, we don't know what King's race is. Big Mom said she has three races that are not in her ranks. I believe one of them's giants. I don't know if we know the other one. And the other one is what King is. And that is pretty much all we've heard about his race since. Like it, and now, what we know is they can conjure fire, which we knew King could do, but, you know, for all, we didn't know why. I always figured that Queen just made him something to get him to shut up or something. And no, he can just conjure fire. Because there are reasons. And this is the part that I find most interesting. And that they used... It's the fact that they used to live at the top of the red line. And it's like, is, it kind of makes me wonder. Because, you know, there were a lot of theories to King's race and why they're not around anymore. Some people thought maybe that they were on God Valley or something and got wiped out once that war happened. Uh, I don't know. Some people thought maybe they were Skypeans or something. Uh, I've just heard so many... I've heard so many theories about King's race. And now we know that they used to live at the top of the red line, or at least according to Marco's rumors. Normally, uh, Odin's not really one to be misleading as far as narration goes. I mean, granted, there have been times where we've been told someone's like godlike powers, and then no, they're not as invincible as we thought. Like, Kaido's a good example. But, uh,. Overall, he's pretty accurate as far as, like, foreshadowing and stuff. He always keeps us guessing, but normally when he gives us a hint, it's normally pretty reliable. You know, he's not like Tagashi with Hunter x Hunter or anything. So, it kind of makes me wonder, did the Celestial Dragons wipe out his race? 
just so that way they could have Bill Marie's walk? Now, granted, the red line goes all the way around the world. So, I don't really know. But as far as we know, the only thing that's on top of the red one, red, red, red line is Marie's walk. So, you know, that just... It, <laughs> that's why I love One Piece. It always keeps me guessing. So basically, Marco buys Zoro enough time. To the point where Zoro comes out and does Purgatory Unikiri. And then you see the panel of Sanji and Zoro taking down King and Queen. And they have an amazing line after that. Hey, Curly Brows, if we win this, I know it's finally in sight. Luffy becoming King of the Pirates. And that is. That is just incredible. It's finally in sight that Luffy becomes king of the pirates. And that is pretty accurate. Like Oda has said that he wants to end the story in around five years or so. And while I doubt that's going to happen, we're definitely getting close to the end of One Piece. Because, like, here's a. No, I'm not going to tell. I'm not going to say it. It's uh, basically Odin. Not Oda. Odin. Oda. Wanted One Piece to only be five years to begin with, but he kept adding. Like originally, it was just supposed to be Luffy versus the four emperors, but he just kept adding so many things, like probably more about the Marines, the warlords, and stuff. The the uh, worst generation, and it just expanded so much. But uh, now that we're finally at the part that was supposed to be One Piece to begin with, Luffy versus the four emperors. And now that they're probably going to bring down two in this first, in this, you know, arc. Okay, I kind of doubt they're going to bring down both of them. But if they do, that leaves Shanks and Blackbeard. And I don't know why Luffy would fight Shanks, but Luffy did say he has to beat all the emperors in order to, you know, become king of the pirates. So he might actually. I know for a fact he's going to fight Blackbeard. He's got to score to stun with Blackbeard. Luffy's normally not one to hold grudges, but there's no way he doesn't hate Blackbeard. Shanks, however, I think he's just going to fight just to show that he surpassed him. And I'm pretty sure it's going to end more on a... Uh, more on, like, Luffy keeping his promise to Shanks, giving him back his hat, and then going to Laugh Tale rather than, like, him actually bringing Shanks down for good. But yeah, the end of One Piece will be in sight as soon as this is over. And with 15 minutes to spare, we're probably not going to get too many chapters of this raid. It's just, I don't know, it's crazy. It's crazy. But anyway, that is my chapter review of chapter 1022. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share. Hit the bell to be notified every single time I upload a video, which uh, now I have, I have a little way for that to be a little more often. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. And if you're wondering what I meant by that, eh, look out for a video coming out within the next couple of days. But anyway, adios.